discretion of the Portland City Council. Good morning, Keelan, please call the roll. Good morning, Mayor. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Here. Hardesty. Come available Here. So Maps. Here. Wheeler. Here. Under Portland City Code and State Law, the City Council is holding this meeting electronically. All members of the Council are attending remotely by video and electronic communications. Uh, all members of the Council are attending remotely by video and teleconference, and the City has made several avenues available for the public to listen to the audio broadcast of this meeting. The meeting is available to the public on the city's YouTube channel, egovpdx, www.portlandoregon.gov slash video and channel 30. The public can also provide written testimony to council by emailing the council clerk at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. The council is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote physical distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires the Council to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all for your patience, your flexibility, and your understanding as we manage through this ongoing challenging situation. And now we'll hear from our illustrious legal counsel. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Mayor. Uh, to participate in council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the council clerk's office for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions or the first readings of ordinances. The published council agenda at portlandoregon.gov forward slash auditor contains information about how and when you may sign up for testimony while the city council is holding electronic meetings. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individually, individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When your time is up, the presiding officer will ask you to conclude. Disruptive conduct, such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being placed on hold or ejected from the remainder of the electronic meeting. Please be aware that all council meetings are recorded. Thank you. Thank you very much. First up, communications, Keelan. It's my understanding that the one individual who'd signed up is withdrawn. Is that true? That's correct, Mayor. Would you like me to read it? You, why don't you read it just for the record in case he pops up or we missed him? Okay. Uh, 94, request of Chris Chorn to address council regarding acoustic harassment and assault. Chris, are you out there? Yeah, I don't see him on the line. All right. Then. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll we'll hear from him on a different day to the consent agenda. Have any items been pulled? We've had no requests. Call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. All right, the consent agenda is adopted. Commissioner Ryan, do you believe you have the crew here for 101 and 102? Uh, I think so, Dory, there's Dory, yes. Good, okay, why don't we read 101 and 102 together, please? Okay. Sounds good. Um, 101, <laughs> approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program under the inclusionary housing program for the bridgehead located at 1360 East Burnside Street and 102 approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program under the inclusionary housing program for North Lombard apartments located at 7550 North Lombard Street. Commissioner Ryan. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Good morning, colleagues. We have two multi-unit limited tax exemption applications today. Items 101 and 102 are both emergency ordinances and ask us to consider approving 
the multi-applications for the Bridgehead and North Lombard apartments. I request that these two items be read together. That already just happened. So um, I will now turn this over to Dory Van Brocklin, who will present and be available for questions. Good morning, Dory. Thanks for being here. Good morning, um, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you. Um, I do have a, a brief presentation that I'll take a moment to share. Sorry about that. Okay, <laughs> thank you as I adjust here a little bit. <laughs> story. I know this probably took you back a bit to know that we are starting a little bit earlier with this. So thanks for uh, okay. jumping in. Kind of reviewing screens and getting them all in the right place. Got it. It's here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for the <laughs> patience. Um, Actually, Dory, so again, um, yeah, they're talk the talking points are what we see first. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. It's okay. There you go. I think that's what you want. All right. You're back on it. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> sure. It's not letting me see my talking points now. It's my problem, I guess. Okay. I apologize for this. I'm. I can certainly wing it without my talking points. So. Tori, why why don't uh, if, if I may be so bold. Um, I'm guessing we've seen most of this presentation before, not specific necessarily to the bridgehead, but I, I think your talking points are probably more valuable to us than the presentation, but, but I'll let it be your call. Yes, I, you know, let's see where, where I can go with this, okay? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, so certainly, um, I think I have points here, and yes, you are pretty well familiar with the inclusionary housing project at this point, as far as our program. So as a quick review, in February of 2017, for the record, you know, any building adding 20 or more new units is required to contribute to the city's rent-restricted housing inventory through the inclusionary housing program. And developers must choose from several options in order to fulfill the inclusionary housing requirements. Um, units can be provided in otherwise market rate buildings, sending units to another building or paying into the inclusionary housing fund. The multiple unit limited tax exemption or multi program, which we're here today to discuss is one of the financial incentives provided to buildings restricting units under the inclusionary housing program rather than paying the fee in lieu. Each multi application comes before city council for approval based on statutory requirement. And today we are bringing these two buildings um, before you. So to go through the specific projects, the, we have the, the bridgehead at 1360 East Burnside and North Lombard Apartments at 7550 North Burnside. And so to talk about the Bridgehead project, um, it's a five story, 143 unit mixed unit or mixed use, excuse me, apartment building comprised of 19 studio, 115 one bedroom and nine two bedroom units. The developer chose the option to restrict at least 15% of the units at 80% of median family income. And that of course is for 99 years under the program. And that amounts to 21 of the total 143 units that will be restricted as inclusionary housing units. So the units are representative of the total units in the building. So that means there'll be three studio, 17 one bedroom and one two bedroom units um, restricted under inclusionary housing for that 99 year time frame. 
Um, based on program requirements, buildings outside of the Central City Plan District are eligible for a property tax exemption on the inclusionary housing units. In this case, that means the 21 units and associated parking um, and percentage of the residential common areas will receive the exemption for the 10 year period. The other 122 market rate units in the land will be fully taxed. So the total estimated um, tax amounts, we go through a little more details. And I continue to navigate this. So the total estimated tax amount or tax exemption amount is 230 thousand dollars roughly and that amounts to over the 99 year term about 111 um, dollars of foregone revenue annually per restricted unit so in comparison um, if we go back to the presentation to look at the rent discount um, between the monthly and annual amount um, so the rent reduction per restricted unit is $4,758. And across the 99 year value, that's um, almost uh, $10 million. While the total estimated tax exemption of foregone revenue is estimated to total to about 200, that $230,000. So as far as additional details on this particular project in, in um, in addition to the 10-year tax exemption provided by the multi, the restricted units will also receive the affordable housing construction excise tax exemption, and um, they will not benefit from SDC exemptions because these are not restricted at the 60% median family income level. So unless there are other questions specifically on this project, I will move on to, well, I guess that goes back through a little bit of the average over 99 years. I'll move on to the other project though, unless there are specific questions right now on the bridgehead. I don't see anybody's hand raised, Dory. Why don't you go ahead? Thank you. So as far as for North Lombard Apartments, it's a three-story, 39-unit residential-only apartment building comprised of two studio and 37 one-bedroom units. This developer also chose to restrict at least 15% of the units to 80% median family income for the 99 years. So that equals uh, six of the total 39 units. And again, they're representative of the total units in the building. So that means there will be six one bedroom units under the inclusionary housing program. Since again, this is outside the Central City Plan District, the property tax exemption will only apply to the inclusionary housing units and the associated percentage of residential common areas over that 10 year period. And that means the other 33 market rate units in the land will be fully taxed. The total estimated tax exemption for this building is just under $70,000. And so over the 99 year term, that's about um, $116 of foregone revenue annually per restricted unit, similar to the other building. Um, the re annual rent reduction per, per restricted unit is $4,812. Across the 99 year term, the total rent reduction for the building totals just under $3 million and the, you know, compared to that $70,000 tax exemption estimate. So you can look at a, a different view of the total benefit versus the, the cost of the tax exemption. So, and, and likewise, this project will also receive the affordable housing construct, construction tax, excise tax exemption. And this is the first uh, application for this ownership group. I'm happy to answer any questions about um, these projects. Thank you and these applications. Thank you, appreciate it. Colleagues, any questions? Uh, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I don't have any questions on these specific ones, but I am curious, Dory, when we will see the, uh, uh, um, the language to change uh, this program so that it's actually more 
equitably uh, used and that there's more uh, benefit for communities uh, who are low income. I know that you have started that process. Maybe Matthew wants to answer that, but. Yes, I can certainly discuss that. So on um, January 20th, we released um, a draft of permanent rules that include some changes to um, the inclusionary housing program, both on the size of the family size units um, and some of the other things that had been addressed by council. So we're in the middle of that public process right now and are inviting um, testimony through February 25th. We have a public hearing on that day as well for anyone to offer any um, feedback in person. The official rule process through the Housing Bureau uh, means that we have until the 24th of March before we would finalize any rules and um, assuming we don't have other changes based on feedback that we'd want to make to what we've published at that point, we could publish the rules thereafter. Um, however, it will take a while before any applications will be actually subject to any new rules that we make because of the um, way that projects are vested in the permitting pipeline. So any of the changes that we make now to the program will affect projects that have new land use or permit applications after the time of the, the rule changes going into effect. Uh, thank you, Dory. And how do we weigh in on that before we finalize this three-year process at the Housing Bureau? How do we as the city council weigh in and how do we get the word out to other people who may have strong opinions about the changes that should take place? Yes, yeah, so certainly anyone is welcome to weigh in um, through the public process, definitely. And the Housing Bureau will be working also with um, our director, Callahan and Commissioner Ryan. And so we can certainly coordinate any council uh, response uh, through the commissioner's office that way as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, any Commissioner. Uh, any other questions? And if not, Keelan, do we have any public testimony on either of these items? Keelan? We do. We have one person signed up, uh, Caitlin Slatlin. Good. Good morning. Caitlin, are you there? Yeah. There yeah. You Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and City Commissioners. To our new commissioners, I want to welcome you. I know you'll serve our city well. My name is Caitlin Slatelum. I use they, them, theirs pronouns, and I am a student at Portland State University testifying today in regards to the multiple unit limited tax exemption program application regarding the Bridgehead Apartments. I have lived in downtown Portland for six years now. I have frequently walked its beautiful streets and I've often, oftentimes find myself looking up into the darkened windows of luxury apartments in the downtown Southwest Portland area and the Northern Pearl District that I, a full-time student and two job holder could never afford. Solutions to societal problems such as the ones we face today in regard to the affordable housing shortage can be solved through business profit. When businesses spend money to solve these community problems, it can fundamentally change the conventional thinking that business profits cause social problems to business profits solving social problems. But we find that not enough businesses are actively seeking to better our city, and the very few who do are rewarded for providing the bare minimum. Of the 145 units in this 10-story project, I just want to remind you that only 22 are reserved for affordable housing. I also want to point out that research shows a dire need for affordable housing to provide three, four, and five bedroom apartments, while the Bridgehead will only offer three studios, 17 one bedrooms, and one two bedroom. This then leaves 121 luxury apartments that will likely remain vacant due to other societal challenges we face in our economy today. Rising healthcare costs, education, quality standard of living, and stagnant wages are all things that we have known for a long time now to be a problem for Portlanders. It is my humble opinion that rewarding millions of dollars in tax exemptions for bare minimum effort in changing these societal problems is not the answer. I don't have all the answers and I don't pretend to have all of them. And I know that you don't have all the answers either, but Portland desperately needs the tax revenue to solve the other multitude of societal problems mentioned previously. 
The problems we face today aren't new. They're decades old structural injustices that provide, that primarily and detrimentally affect the poor and our community members of color. The city of Portland needs affordable housing. We don't need luxury apartments. The city of Portland needs tax revenue from these luxury apartments to fund the Gateway Green Park and to pay off the interstate corridor urban renewal debt. We know these businesses will see a return on investment. They don't need a tax break on top. Corporations and businesses exist to produce and provide the needs of society. By ensuring that more desperately needed affordable housing options are created and tax revenue funds coming from luxury goods are used to solve our problems can garner and foster trust that is so desperately needed in our city representatives. Thank you for your time. Thank you, appreciate it. Was there any more testimony, uh, Keelan? Any other individuals? No, that's all that signed up. Colleagues, any further questions for Dory? Please call the roll on item 101. Rubio. I wanna thank Dory for this presentation and the Portland Housing Bureau for their continuing work on affordable housing accessibility and availability. And I also really want to thank Caitlin for her testimony today because she raises important points that I know that we all care about and we've all talked about. I'm happy to support this application and I also want to continue to encourage developers to consider additional options of inclusionary housing units within their project as we just heard. Affordability is only one part of this equation um, and accessibility must go hand in hand with it. So I'll be looking to keep accessibility and affordability and especially more deeply affordable units at the forefront of these projects. And again, I'm happy uh, to see projects like these today. I vote aye. Ryan. Yeah, first of all, thank you, Dory, for um, that presentation and for also stepping up um, earlier than you, I think we're prepared to do. Uh, we got through that. I want to also say that I appreciate the questions from uh, Commissioner Hardesty. We will make sure that the Housing Bureau and my office keeps you abreast and include you um, so that when we come back on the 24th of March, um, it's no surprise. Um, I just want to also acknowledge that the North Lombard Apartments and the Bridgehead bring the total number of private sector buildings in the inclusionary housing permit approval pipeline to 118 restricting a minimum of 942 units in what otherwise would have been market rate developments. I know it's a baby step at times, but it's a step and I look forward to this improving. I vote aye. Hard to see. Uh, thank you very much, Dory, for your presentation. I also wanna thank Caitlin. Uh, ever since I first heard of this program, it's been, uh, it's been a, I think, a two-edged sword, right? On one hand, we're adding uh, several units in places where um, we don't have housing that people can afford to live in. Um, on the other hand, um, at 80%, uh, what we're telling people is they have to make $70,000 to be able to afford an affordable housing unit, which uh, in my mind is, is crazy. Um, uh, uh, we've had this conversation many times about the pros and cons of this program. And I wanna really thank uh, Director uh, Callahan uh, for continuing to hear these concerns and continuing to act on these concerns. I look forward to us making this program better and maybe making it more Portland-centric uh, than uh, what the state law allows. I, I believe at some point, we're gonna to have to go back to the state and fundamentally change how this program operates. Uh, but again, um, all uh, due credit uh, to Dory and Matthew and the other staff in the Housing Bureau and Commissioner Ryan, I am so grateful that you're the Housing Commissioner because I know uh, this touches your soul just like it touches mine. Um, it's important that we actually uh, 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 provide as much housing that people can afford to live in as possible. Um, and so today I will vote aye um, uh, reluctantly because I continue to have the concerns that have been expressed here today. I vote aye. Max. Um, I'd like to thank staff and Caitlin for their presentations today. I vote aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted 102. Please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. 
All right, the ordinance is adopted back to the time certain number 95, please. Amend the Portland Parks and Recreation FY 2020-21 budget to allow expenditures related to the parks local option levy. And could you also read item 96, please? Authorize a temporary interfund loan not to exceed $22 million from Portland Parks and Recreation System Development Charge Fund to the 2020 Parks Local Option Levy Fund to provide interim financing for park operations. Colleagues, we're here today to begin implementation of the will of the voters. In November, voters showed their support for our parks and recreation system by overwhelmingly supporting a five-year operating levy for Portland Parks and recreation. As parks commissioner at the time, I was very proud to ensure that as part of the city council's referral of the parks levy to the ballot, the referral language promised the community that levy resources would support summer 2021 public recreation programming, care for our parks and natural areas, and build community partnerships. Today, we have two important ordinances that will allow us to deliver on these promises that we as a council made to the voters. I have sponsored an ordinance for an interfund loan that will allow Portland Parks and Recreation to accept levy resources now, instead of waiting until November in 2021 when tax resources will be collected. And Commissioner Rubio, as our new Parks Commissioner, has sponsored an ordinance to amend the parks budget for the fiscal year 2021 and authorizes PPNR to create new positions and to begin spending those resources right now. Now I'd like to have Commissioner Rubio lead us through the two presentations for this important endeavor. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. As we are all aware, COVID-19 has changed so much for this community and it's strained the city budget and many Portlanders and our local businesses are struggling to survive. But amid that struggle, Portlanders are also turning to our parks and natural spaces for their physical and emotional well being. And as a longtime nonprofit executive director, I saw firsthand how parks enrich the lives of Portlanders and contribute to the health of our community. Parks and natural spaces bolster us against the ills of climate change. And when we emerge from this public health crisis, we want our parks to be there, ready to celebrate our city's arts and culture and community. And I cannot wait for that. And I know all of you have said that you felt the same as well. And while the COVID pandemic has hit Portland Parks and Recreation especially hard, we're so grateful to the voters um, who made the decision to invest in our parks and recreation system. And I'm especially proud that their budget does what we as a council have agreed to do in all our work. It centers equity, inclusiveness, and Black, Indigenous, and people of color and communities of East Portland. I'd like to thank and introduce Parks Director Adina Wong and Debt Manager Matt Gearock. Their hard, thoughtful work has produced a budget that reflects our city's values. I will now turn it over to Parks Director Adina Wong to share details of the fiscal year 2021 supplemental budget proposal. Director Wong. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio and Mayor Wheeler. Good morning to you both and to Commissioners Hardesty, Maps, and Ryan as well. Morning. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'd like to begin with acknowledgments of my team who helped us get to this hearing. They're also available to answer your questions if needed. Thanks to Todd Lofgren, our de deputy director, Claudio Campuzano, who I understand is having some internet uh, issues, but hopefully will be able to join us if the need arises. Uh, and I'd like to note that our division managers have also joined us today. Thank you to our invited guests and the community members who have signed up to give public testimony. We appreciate the many ways you support Portland's parks, natural areas, urban forest, and recreation system. So let's get started on the presentation. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today to share Portland Parks and Recreation's fiscal year 2021 supplemental budget ordinance and an interfund loan ordinance. Both ordinances are related to our recently approved five-year local option levy and making good on the promises we made to the community to offer summer 2021 programming. We are grateful for Portlander, Portland voters' support. Next slide, please. We have a diverse parks and recreation system treasured by Portlanders. 
In the 2019 Portland Insight Survey, access to the outdoors and natural areas was what people liked most about Portland, regardless of race, age, or how long they've lived here. We typically offer robust programming at 12 community and arts centers and five indoor and seven outdoor pools. We manage 146 neighborhood parks and 8,000 acres of green infrastructure in our natural areas. In those natural areas and parks are 1.2 million trees. Next slide, please. Equity has been and continues to be at the forefront of our management decisions. We've made progress despite past funding challenges. For example, we've built new parks in underserved communities. In late November, we opened Gateway Green, and in 2021, we'll open a new park in Park Lane. We've made our workforce more reflective of the Portland community, and we're prioritizing contracting equity, having achieved more than double the city's goal. In a typical year, we offer culturally responsive programming at our community centers and parks, programs like Parks for New Portlanders, Portland World Soccer, and Summer Free for All. In the wake of George Floyd's murder and Black Lives Matter protests, we held racial justice li listening sessions for all staff and committed to becoming an anti-racist organization. 29 staff members recently completed anti-racist results-based accountability training, which we will which will guide us in our future planning processes. Equity and inclusion manager Kenya Williams and his team are working on an equity lens that the Bureau can use for decision making. Next slide, please. We've done well with the resources we have, but the city's parks and recreation system has some large inequities. For example, people want their parks to be clean and to feel safe, but safety is more of a barrier for Portlanders of color and East Portland residents. Next slide, please. And past surveys have shown that cost is also more of a barrier to Portlanders of color and East Portland residents. Next slide, please. And in our parks and recreation system overall, tree canopy coverage is inequitable for those living east of the Willamette. Access to parks and natural areas, playgrounds and community centers all benefit some Portlanders more than others and leaves those who live in East Portland with less access. Over the long term, we will need to work together to create a parks and recreation system that is equitable for all Portlanders. This is a key tenant of the work we're doing with this proposed supplemental budget. And it will take continued investment over time. Next slide, please. COVID-19 changed everything for our Bureau in terms of how we operate and the services we can offer. We closed community centers, indoor and outdoor pools, and laid off or didn't hire most of our casual seasonal staff, meaning that more than 1,700 people were without work last summer. This slide shows estimated service reductions just from canceling our 2020 program, some, uh, summer programs. Our budget picture also changed dramatically as most of our revenue generating services were shuttered and remain shuttered. Our program revenue was reduced by more than 15 million. As you know, the city expects to have continued financial impact from COVID-19 well into the 21-22 fiscal year. Our bureau was already struggling prior to COVID-19. After years of underinvestment in infrastructure and operational capacity, we have been stretched to meet demand for service. With the voter approved parks levy, we have the chance to bring back essential community programs in summer 2021 that are affordable for all and to reset our organization to provide equitable public services. Next slide, please. The summer service estimates you see on this slide represent our best thinking at this time, but we will have to be flexible and refine our program plans as public health guidelines change. For now, we focused on outdoor programming and recreation for children and youth. As COVID guidelines allow, we are excited to offer physically distant, outdoor swimming lessons, summer camps, fitness in the park, nature day camps, and tennis lessons in the park. In addition, we will continue to focus on providing free lunches through our lunch and play program. This summer, we will also augment this vital program with arts programming for children and families. 
Lastly, summer programming means that we will hire a lot of casual and seasonal staff. We're expecting to hire up to 1,850 staff members this summer. We will once again be one of the largest summer youth employers in the city. Let's walk through our fiscal year 2021 supplemental budget request. Next slide, please. For our recreation for all services, we will open and operate our outdoor swimming pools with a focus on providing community swim lessons. We'll also operate 18 splash pads in our parks. We will provide summer camps for children in outdoor settings. For example, for our camps related to sun schools, we have identified three to five outdoor parks close to sun sites that will serve as locations. We will also be hosting summer camps associated with the Multnomah Art Center and Community Music Center. We will use our community centers to support outdoor programming. Our tennis center will be hosting tennis lessons in the parks and we will continue and expand our fitness in the parks program that we pilot, piloted in the summer of 2020. And our virtual programming will continue. Next slide, please. To bolster program access, we're allocating additional resources for inclusion services, inclusive and adaptive recreation and language translation services for marketing and signage. Levy resources mean we're able to rethink our programs and end our reliance on program fees. We don't want cost to be a barrier to participation, especially for those community members who are underserved. For all registered summer programs, we will seek to have 50% BIPOC, immigrant and refugee and families living in poverty participate in registered programs. And we'll be working with community partners to achieve this level of enrollment. Levy Resources will also allow us to launch a feasibility study to explore the expansion of the Interstate Firehouse Cultural Center as a center for black arts and culture. Many of you know that we've been supporting a community advisory committee in the development of a vision and sustainable model for the facility. We are excited to continue to work with the community on this great project. Without levy resources, more than 35 jobs would be in jeopardy in recreation services. And levy resources are allowing us to add three full-time equivalents, making three nine-month season excuse me, three nine month summer free for all staff into permanent year round positions. Next slide. Next are protect and grow nature services. Our land stewardship team has been under resourced for years. In the last 10 years, our city's population has grown by 13% and our field staff who keep our parks clean and safe has declined by 11%. For many years, we've had fewer people to care for parks. COVID-19 has exacerbated this problem and safety protocols calling for increased time to clean and sanitize. As part of building organizational capacity, we will be providing additional FTE to work on the east side of Portland, a park tech to address immediate needs and a supervisor to staff a new work unit. The current East Zone Maintenance Supervisor is responsible for the daily care of 50 parks. To support our urban forests, we will be adding support for our tree planting program and park tree maintenance and emergency response. Currently, the Bureau can only respond to emergencies. We will begin building a team to handle proactive tree maintenance in parks, which will improve the health of our tree canopy and safety to the public. We kept safety in mind. We are adding a swing shift supervisor to support park techs working the swing shift. This will improve safety and maintenance on our parks and will also provide important support for our staff in the field. Additional security at maintenance facilities will protect staff and public resources. And we will be adding needed equipment and vehicles to support field staff. Levy resources will allow us to initially add 16 FTE to protect and grow nature with more to come in the fall bump process. Next slide, please. Our environmental education program will be scaling up for the summer. We are increasing capacity for nature day camp participants by 50%. This investment will provide the foundation to grow this program even more in future years. Like our recreation programs, environmental education will seek to have 50% BIPOC, immigrant and refugee 
and families experiencing financial hardship participate in registered programs. We will also build capacity in our youth conservation crew, teen nature team, and teen internships. These are amazing education programs, but they're also great entry points into the parks and recreation workforce. By focusing on BIPOC, immigrant and refugee, and low-income communities, we're creating access to enrichment and job opportunities. Next slide, please. Levy resources will be used to increase community grants so that our partners can assist in program participant registration and staff hiring. Additional work this year will be setting up a levy oversight committee. Partnering with the community, particularly with organizations that support BIPOC immigrants and refugees, families living in poverty, people living with disabilities and older adults will help the Bureau achieve its equity goals. Community engagement is a critical part of our planning framework and one of the pillars of our equity work. Next slide, please. For Portland Parks and Recreation to deliver successful community outcomes, we will be expanding and transforming our services over the next few years. This means more Bureau employees to deliver essential services to improve the lives of Portlanders. As we've discussed, to be able to do this, Portland Parks and Recreation needs to refresh our strategies, policies, and procedures to promote equity and safety. We will also need to enhance our recruitment and hiring to continue to diversify our teams. Next slide, please. While we add more people, we need to offer them space and tools to meet the community's needs. We will need to rent new maintenance facilities and procure the proper equipment and technology such as upgrading our out-of-date work order system. We will also need to enhance our capacity for transparency and accountability with the public in our budgeting and performance monitoring. In total, we are requesting to add 31 FTE to do this work. Next slide, please. Portland Parks and Recreation's supplemental budget ordinance is for $9 million of parks levy funds. This chart shows what our overall fiscal year 2021 operating budget looks like with our levy funded supplemental budget request. We will cover this funding with a partner ordinance that will allow for an interfund loan from our parks system development charge fund. The interfund loan ordinance allows for a total of 22 million, which is the maximum possible levy amount we would use in fiscal year 2021 and through the first five months of fiscal year 21-22 until we start to receive tax levy dollars. Next slide, please. This is a summary of our supplemental budget request of 9 million. This proposed budget ensures that we can provide as robust services as public health guidance and our capacity to scale up will allow. Next slide, please. Portland Parks and Recreation is proud of the essential services we provide to the community, and we are grateful to Portlanders who supported the parks levy. Our supplemental budget request is critical to our ability to offer summer recreation and environmental programs to support youth and families in our community, especially BIPOC, immigrants, and refugees and families living with low income. This request will also save and create jobs, permanent full-time positions in the Bureau, and summer employment for young people at a time when many are struggling economically. I'm going to turn it over to Matt Gearock now to present our Interfund Loan Ordinance. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thanks, Adina. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler, uh, Commissioner Rubio and City Council. For the record, I'm Matt Gearock, Debt Manager in the Bureau of Revenue and Financial Services. I'm also joined by Bridget O'Callaghan, City Treasurer, as additional background, interfund loans are used to provide low cost, short term internal financing for city projects. By using an interfund loan, the city is able to avoid financing and legal costs that are typically incurred when using external financing sources. Regarding this specific interfund loan, the loan will be capped at 22 million and structured as a drawdown loan to minimize interest expense incurred by the park's local option levy fund. As previously noted, the source of the funding is system development charge reserves, which are budgeted in the capital, Parks Capital Improvement Fund. 
It's anticipated that the loan will be drawn down in two draws, one draw occurring immediately in FY 2021 for current year expenditures. Another draw will occur in FY 21-22 for expenditures that occur before November tax collections are received next fiscal year. The interfund loan will be repaid in full no later than January 31st of 2022, providing adequate cushion on timing of property tax receipts. As previously noted, um, the parks levy is expected to generate roughly 45 million in property tax revenues in FY 21-22, so initial property tax receipts in November are projected, projected to exceed interfund loan repayment requirements with substantial cushion. Interfund loan interest will accrue at the city's investment fund rate and compound monthly, resulting in neutral economics and no opportunity costs of lost interest earnings to the parks capital improvement fund and system development charge reserves. The interest rate is expected to not exceed 0.75%, which results in the maximum projected interest costs of $120,000 for the loan. That concludes the overview of the terms of the interfund loan and I'm happy to answer any questions. Very good, colleagues, any questions at this point? Uh, Commissioner Wright. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And thank you, uh, Director Long and Matt for that presentation. It's very good. I can't think of a better investment than um, what we need to do to be ready this summer. I do have a question about the loan, and that is, and you you laid it out really well uh, in terms of the the payments that be made and when um, when you would bring it back. So I appreciate that. I'm looking out how many years, five years, and so I'm just wondering, will we be in a, a situation five summers from now where we will? What will we do then? I just want to hear the the rationale for how this will play out um, if we're bringing in the revenue early, will we be in a, um, will we be uh, backed up um, five years from now, if that's the duration? Just uh, lay that out for me, please. Sure, I believe based on the projections that um, there is not expected to be any sort of um, mismatch in terms of revenues and, and expenditures. Um, so um, yeah, we, we considered that when, when structuring the interfund loan. So there shouldn't be any sort of gap at the end. Thanks for understanding my question. Um, I just didn't hear that in the presentation. So I wanted to make sure that I asked that question. Thanks so much. So now we have some invited testimony. So I'm gonna ask if maybe we can get through the testimony and hear from these folks. Yeah, go ahead. Do you wanna call them up commissioner? And then we will have to. Um... All right. So now it's my pleasure to introduce um, invited testimony to give us a fuller picture of the programs that Levy Resources will support. We have six people today and I'll read their names um, a couple at a time. Uh, the first two are Bonnie G. Yausik from the Parks Board and Andre Middleton, Portland Parks and Recreation Budget Advisory Committee. Welcome. Hi there, thank you. Mayor, commissioners, my name is Bonnie Giosik and I have the privilege of serving as vice chair of the Parks Board. In this role, I also serve on the Bureau's Budget Advisory Committee, which reviewed the Bureau's programs and budgetary considerations over three meetings. This year, as you know, we're in a unique position with the Parks 2020 operating levy, which voters overwhelmingly approved to provide recreation for all, to protect and grow nature, and to support community partnerships. The BAC supports the Bureau's response to the current economic and public health crisis by requesting council's approval of a supplemental budget ordinance and an interfund loan ordinance. These measures will allow the Bureau to access levy resources in this current year to provide summer programs, build capacity for levy funded program expansion and address areas of potential critical failure. Fundamentally, they will allow the Bureau to support the physical and mental health of the community during this challenging time. Bureau staff will create a complete levy budget as part of the fall bump in September, including setup of a levy oversight committee and a community process to inform decision-making about the use of levy resources. The requested budget advances the BAC core values, which are equity, safety, maintenance, and is a step toward financial sustainability. Briefly, equity. 
the Bureau continues to demonstrate its strong commitment to equity by centering summer recreation, environmental education, and youth and employment internship programs, providing opportunities for BIPOC, immigrants and refugees, and other vulnerable families, including safety net food programs. Safety. The Bureau will provide proactive investment in the care and parks of urban forest so that parks and natural areas are well cared for, well maintained, safe and welcoming. Maintenance. This request includes increased support for the major maintenance budget as directed by Council to prevent the Bureau from losing more ground against its backlog of deferred maintenance, currently more than $500 million. And finally, financial sustainability. While the operating levy stabilizes programs and services in the short term, long-term financial sustainability is essential to an equitable parks and recreation system. We will continue to emphasize this critical element with the work ahead. We encourage council to support the requested budget and approve the use of levy funds immediately. As you've heard us emphasize before, our system of parks and recreation services is essential infrastructure and COVID-19 has emphasized this fact even more. Healthy Parks, Healthy Portland is not just the Bureau's tagline, it's the vision of public health the Bureau seeks to achieve. Your support will allow this vision to become a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Andre? Um, good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners Hardesty, Rubio, Ryan, and Maps. Um, for the record, my name is Andre Middleton. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the Executive Director of Friends of Noise, a youth-focused arts nonprofit that supports all ages music. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that even in this virtual space, we are guests of the traditional and unceded lands of the Multnomah, Wasco, Kaplanet, Cowlitz, Clackamas, Fans of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other indigenous peoples. As we endeavor to be better stewards of Portland Parks and Rec, I hope that we can meet the challenge to return land back to the first stewards of this land that we currently call home. I come before you as a member of the Portland Parks and Recreation Budget Advisory <laughs> Committee to advocate for the park supplemental budget request for year 2020 to 2021 and the park levy. I was honored when the Arts and Culture Special Events Manager Sue Pox admitted my name for consideration to join this committee because it signaled what a strong partner Portland Parks and Rec had become to me in terms of noise. Um, while serving on the Budget Advisory Committee, I've been welcomed and seen as a valued member of our community whose experience with our parks are validated. Working alongside park staff and other concerned community members um, has been extremely valid validating and has been analogous to a professional development program for me personally. Um, during our meetings, we advocate for using a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens to a budgetary process that has to see to the safety and well being of our community members, sustain community centered programming, and maintain an upkeep of a broad portfolio of physical assets. As a resident of the Cully neighborhood, I live near a dog park that draws neighbors and their furry friends from far and wide. Another local park has been a gathering point for summer movies, concerts for years, not to mention spring and summer sports. A third local park is a newly added park that uses innovative design, materials, and surfaces to be accessible to children with different abilities and their families. The livability of my and all neighborhoods in your charge are impacted by our networks and parks. Investing in our parks is an investment in our communities that yields tangible results. I used to be a nanny for a family that lives in the West Hills and Hamilton Park is but walking distance from their home. This park and the tree canopy in the neighborhood adds to the values of their homes by reducing the overall, the area's overall heat signature. East Portland residents need local parks to contribute to the livability of their neighborhoods as well. Allocating resources via the park supplemental budget request um, and the parks levy is a step towards addressing decades of inequitable distribution of resources and service towards East Portland and East County residents. <clears throat> While the maintenance and repair of our parks is of utmost importance, investing in human resources is vital to our community as well. Three years ago, when I saw the public when that Portland Parks and Recreation was hiring teens to be summer food for our counters, I knew that such an opportunity would be a perfect as my daughter's first job. Um, the experience of working with young children in East Portland, earning income and learning how to navigate a workplace environment has been such a positive experience for her. Each year, thousands 
of people like my daughter work to make our parks and neighborhoods safe and nurturing spaces. Whether it's at Gateway Discovery Park or at Multnomah Art Center, the seasonal employees that help make so many parks hum with activity can't do it without the fiscal resources needed to sustain them. Our parks are a treasure resource for all members of our community, homeowners and renters, young and old, housed and those without housing, the healthy and the infirm. In order to serve and be accessible to all members of our community, the funding allocated for our parks and rec needs to meet the need. The park supplemental budget request um, for 2020 and 2021 and the parks levy is a step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Next, we have Randy Gregg, Executive Director of Portland Parks Foundation, and then following him, Pharrell Richards, uh, Laborer Local 483. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, thank you for uh, letting me be here. Um, on behalf of our board, the Portland Parks Foundation urges you to vote in favor of Portland Parks and Recreation's uh, 2021 um, Supplemental Budget Ordinance and the Interfund Loan Ordinance. Um, whether we're developing a bridge over a dangerous crossing of the iconic Wildwood Trail or inventing a new kind of festival to help heal downtown that I'll be sharing with you in a few weeks, um, the Portland Parks Foundation exists to help people, help parks, and to help our city. In this case, we led the political campaign to pass the five-year le levy that has provided this opportunity to sustainably fund our park system. We had some pretty big shoes to fill with then Parks Commissioner Nick Fish's untimely death at the sort of start of the thinking about this. Um, on a personal note, I, I had never run a campaign and uh, only have written about them and interrogated some of you during them. Um, and it's a whole lot harder to be in your shoes, uh, I'll tell you. Um, but, you know, Commissioner Fish laid uh, a lot of critically important groundwork for the levy with the Sustainable Future Initiative that precisely spelled out scenarios for needs and for funding options. Um, Public polling back in May uh, conducted, uh, the PPR conducted, showed strong support for our park system overall, but we knew that the November ballot would be crowded and a private poll the foundation conducted showed one third of the voters were, eh, probably yes. Some notable parks political champions told us that support was too shaky to proceed. But our polling also showed that we could turn maybe into a solid yes if we explained that a park's funding crisis was unfolding in real time due to COVID, that a 10 year decline in parks maintenance finally would be reversed and that the levy's passage would guarantee equitable access to parks and recreation for children and families and seniors. I gotta tell you, this is the most challenging fundraising uh, I and the foundation have ever done. Um, and I can safely say we did not buy this levy. We earned our support across the political spectrum from tiny grassroots or organizations like Brown Folks Fishing and Wild Diversity to dozens of parks friends groups to political powerhouses like the Portland Business Alliance and the home builders of Metropolitan Portland. Um, Portlanders love their parks and when they learned the park system was in trouble, they overwhelmingly voted to support it and to improve it. The ordinances before you will save positions, create new living wage jobs and employ hundreds of seasonal uh, workers this summer, a lot of them youth. Most importantly, they will allow Portland Parks and Recreation to provide summer, 21, tw tw summer 2021 programs for youth and families at a time when the community really needs them most. So please support the ordinances, but let's also remember that these ordinances, indeed the levy itself, are only a down payment. And let's begin mapping our path to a truly sustainable future uh, for the Portland Park System. The foundation stands ready to help. Thank you so much. Thank you, Randy. Next we have Pharrell. Hello, my name is Farrell Richards, although I do get called Pharrell by younger folks quite a bit. So uh, I'm gonna be reading from a prepared text, but uh, hopefully you'll understand that um, there's a lot of data to go over and um, I'm coming from a place where I'm really so pleased to be here speaking in support of something. So good morning, Mayor Wheeler and all the city commissioners. Um, 
I'm Farrell Richards, as I said, some years back, I worked for Portland Park, Parks and Rec myself as a seasonal maintenance worker. And then I went on to work 10 years at the Portland Bureau of Transportation before taking on my current role, which is business manager of Labor's Local 483 about five years ago. So our union represents hardworking folks all across the city of Portland, which includes the Bureau of Transportation Maintenance Operations, Bureau of Environmental Systems, as well as Portland Parks and Rec. Within Parks and Rec, our members maintain and patrol the city's vast network of parks, as well as the natural areas that go along with that bureau. They run the community centers and the pools. They teach classes and educate preschool students. They manage the urban canopy through our urban forestry folks. They ensure iconic locations that include Waterfront Park, Portland International Raceway, Leach Botanical Gardens, and Forest Park are all kept accessible to Portlanders and visitors. So if you've walked through any such place like Lentz Park or visited a facility like East Portland Community Center, you've met our members and you've seen the results of their work. After years of difficult budgets, like I said, I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here talking about the inner fund transfer for Portland Parks and Rec. I view it as a turn toward building a more sustainable parks bureau, one that will provide as well as sustain the living wage jobs that are performed by the diverse members of our community. For too long, these workers have endured stressful budget cycles and had to deal with the harsh reality of both proposed and real cuts to their jobs and the services those jobs provide. The Interfund Loan Ordinance and Supplemental Budget Ordinance allow Parks and Rec to act pandemic recovery role in the post-pandemic recovery of our city as was well documented in Director Long's presentation. The Parks and Rec Bureau workforce is among the most diverse workforces within the larger city portfolio. Data from the city's demographic dashboard for fiscal year 2019 shows that 10.5% of the parks workforce identifies as black, 8.8% as Latinx, and 6.2% as Asian. Looked at another way, 33% of the parks workforce come from communities of color. 56.1% of the parks workforce are women. Your support of these ordinances today will give the Parks Bureau the opportunity to lead with equity by returning these jobs to the community. Our union supports and welcomes the Bar Parks Bureau's plan to increase diverse recruitment efforts by partnering with community organizations. I want to by partnering with community organizations. I want to thank you for your opportunity to speak today to this funding decision, uh, as well as I'd like to offer a thank you to the many unions, including laborers who made significant contributions to the parks levy success. Uh, with that, I would just say that laborers local 483 urges the council to vote to support the interfund loan ordinance and supplemental, supplemental budget ordinance, which is a little harder to say. Uh, if you have any questions about it and the impact it's going to have on our members, I'm available and lead representative Tom Collette are available for more information. Thank you. Thank you, Farrell. And I sincerely apologize for mispronouncing your name. It's important to get it right. So thank you no. for that. Um, next, we have um, Antoinette Edwards, IFCC Community Advisory Committee, and Isaiah Johnson, Teen Rec Leader from the East Portland Community Center. Good morning, <laughs> Mayor and commissioners, and I'm, I'm just excited to be here. Uh, I can say Commissioner Ryan, Commissioner Maps, Commissioner Rubio for the very first time. And I feel like the song, uh, make new friends, but keep the old. So you're not old, Ted, <laughs> uh, Mayor and uh, Commissioner Hardesty. I, but I this feel is it sometimes <laughs> though, Antoinette, I feel it. <laughs> and it's okay. I'm an elder, so I, I respect that. I am just excited to be here this morning um, in representing the Community Advisory Board and uh, from for IFCC. And someone once said that to have a gift to be grateful is like having a gift and not opening it. We want to open it in front of you and say thank you, thank you, thank you for funding the feasibility study. And I really want to appreciate Director Long for the partnership and really respecting our committee and working closely with us along the way. We came together, we were city appointed and we came together to be there six weeks, but two and a half years 
we're still involved. And I really want to borrow from uh, Commissioner Hardesty and Commissioner Ryan. When something touches your soul, you stay in it. You in it. And that's what this is about. So you giving us that money for the feasibility study helps us to move on. And it will allow the CAC in partnership with the Portland Parks and Recreation to further develop our vision to expand and redevelop the IFCC site as a center for Black arts and culture operated as a mission-driven nonprofit. I want to say that again, a center for Black arts and culture. And for the new members, I just want to give you a little bit of background. Uh, in 1982, IFCC was founded as a cultural center in North Portland by Charles Jordan, Portland's first Black commissioner and Portland and Parks and Recreation's first Black director. For three decades, IFCC operated as a thriving neighborhood art center. Due to city budget cuts and changes in building management, IFCC has been dormant and underutilized since 2015. In 2018, IFCC CAC was appointed to develop a vision and to recommend an operating model for IFCC. And these amazing team members have just been um, uh, amazing. Uh, their commitment, their dedication and volunteering and to stay the course until we see this through. The CAC and parks have seen five changes in parks commissioners since then, from Commissioner Fritz to Commissioner Fish, the mayor, back to Commissioner Fritz, and now to Commissioner Rubio. For every step of the way, Commissioner Fritz, Fish, and the mayor expressed that IFCC was a priority with their full support, and we thank you for that. Now, Commissioner Rubio, we look forward to working with you and all of the city council to fulfill on the promises made to realize our vision to expand IFCC into a center for black arts and culture. As Picasso stated, art washes from the soul the dust of everyday life. We are in need of that. Art is something that centers us and brings us all together. So in our appreciation and in our gratitude, for your commitment to this work, I'd just like to take this moment to invite you all to become friends of IFCC CAC. That almost sounds like a song, IFCC CAC. We want you all to know what it means to us and we invite you to help us move this vision. And we're on a mission. And this is an opportunity to create a legacy project. And we invite you to be a part of that. We need you. The community needs you. It's something that can bring us all together. And uh, in my closing, I only want to share this in honoring Charles Jordan. I knew him well. And in honoring Black History Month, share with you just a few of the words from the amazing poem that inspired me from Amanda. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. And every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country our people diverse and beautiful will emerge, battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new day blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If we're only brave enough to see it, if we're only brave enough to be it. So we invite you to become that light as we climb that hill together. And we're so looking forward to the opportunity to work with all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Antoinette. Next, we have... Um, I Good morning, City Council. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Isaiah Johnson. I'm a recreation lead for teen services at East Portland Community Center. I've worked for teen services for nearly five years, beginning at Charles Jordan Community Center when I was 16. But my time with Teen Forest goes back much longer than that. Living in Northeast Portland, I grew up in a working family and often had to take care of my younger brother. Like many other families and youth in the area, our parks and community centers were more than just a place to go play. From the youth camps, classes, and activities, there was always something to do. For me, teen services was something that changed my life. Not only did it give me an employment opportunity, but it played a large role in keeping me safe. The community center was somewhat of a home away from home. It was more than just a place where I could go play basketball and meet friends. It was a place where I could learn and feel accepted and safe. Being an African-American male, it is often hard to answer the question of what do you wanna be when you grow up? 
Teen Services has a diverse group of caring staff who come from all different backgrounds. So for me, like many other kids, it is incredible to see people who look like you who are doing something that you would like to do one day. Many of the staff are more than just staff. They are role models, teachers, and friends to members of the community just by being themselves. With us bringing back up to 1,850 positions this summer, we can bring back the many incredible people who make a huge difference in not only the youth lives, but to reconnect with the entire community. Now, having transitioned from experiencing the program as a youth to working with Teen Force, Teen Force I try to make the same positive impact on the youth that the staff did on me. This is personal to, be, personal to me because I was once that youth, and I also have a younger brother who was involved with Teen Force. He can see people who look like him who are positive role models in his life. He can have a safe space to play and enjoy his free time rather than possibly be tied into something that could be detrimental to his growth as a young adult. This past summer, we saw the effect of the public recreation programs being canceled on the youth. Violence erupted in the city and we lost several aspiring youth who were part of Team Force. Public recreation programs are a lifeline for families and even more so in the summer when youth are out of school. With your support, Youth can not only enjoy the many camps and activities that we offer, but enjoy a safe space where they can grow and play. These funds will allow Portland Parks and Recreation to provide an outlet and support to all communities in Portland during a crucial time of year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isaiah. And I wanna thank all our dedicated volunteers and staff for taking the time to testify today. We appreciate your service and commitment to parks so very much. This concludes our presentation. And Mayor, I'll turn it back to you for any further public testimony and discussion. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio, and thanks to all of our invited testimony. Congratulations. This is really something that's exciting for all of us. And we know that you all put your shoulders to the collective wheel. So thank you for your leadership. Uh, Keelan, do we have any public testimony for these items? No, Mayor, we don't have anybody on the call for these items. All right, good. Um, then with that, Commissioner Rubio, I understand you'd like to make an amendment to these items? Yes, um, because these ordinances are so important for parks and recreation to be able to prepare for summer 2021, I propose that we make them emergency ordinances. Is, okay. there, any, is there any discussion? We have a motion from, com and, and I will assume this is both for uh, items 95 and 96, is that correct, Commissioner Rubio? Yes, that is correct. And Commissioner Hardesty, can I assume your second is for both Ordinance 95 as well as 96? That is correct, sir. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion amongst council members on the amendments proposed? Keelan, please call the roll on item number, the amendment to item number 95, please. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Yeah, just I want to say thank you to everyone who presented. It was really, um, it was exciting actually to hear from so many community members, some who I know and haven't seen for a while. And um, our city needed that hour of time um, to get excited about what's coming. Um, I was actually excited when I learned that this was going to be on the agenda today. I'm very proud to support this item and help parks get their process going for summer programming. <laughs> So need it. Um, Portlanders of all ages and backgrounds need a safe place to go. And for me, there's two things that really stick out and it's the summer youth program. Uh, at, I, I think we all know how important that is in terms of building life skills and building a career. You need to build those soft skills, which uh, is about showing up on time and doing your job well. And we really need more opportunities like that. And also the programming. Um, as someone that's advocated for our children and youth, especially those of color and those who um, don't have the same resources as some, the parks have always been there to really help what we call the summer melt, which is when um, basically uh, scores go down, um, enrichment that's not offered to them is needed somewhere. And the parks has been the go-to in the city for years. And I think we don't give that enough attention. And they've also been there to always help the schools in the summer when it comes to food distribution. All of this is so key. And I know that you did all the best you could last summer, but to see this coming back with, with more infrastructure than ever, that's great. Um, thank you for answering the questions about the, the, the bridge loan, if you will, to get this started. It makes complete sense. I just wanted to hear that. Um, I just wanna once again, thank uh, Commissioner Rubio and Director Long for your leadership. This is very exciting. I vote aye. Artisty. Aye. Maps. 
Um, I want to thank staff and community members for their presentation uh, today. Um, I'm glad that we as a council can uh, help parks uh, reopen again this summer. And I think that's an important step to opening up our entire community. Um, those are some of the reasons why I'm happy to vote aye. Wheeler. Aye, the amendment to item 95 passes to the amendment to item 96, adding an emergency clause. Any further discussion, seeing none, please call the roll to the amendment. Rubio. This is for the second amendment, I'm just- clarifying. Correct, we, oh. we're, we are voting to add an emergency clause to item 96. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. All right, the amendment is adopted item 96. Now to the main motion, item number 95 is amended. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call the roll. Rubio. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to clarify. So this is for now the whole packet. Old kit and caboodle okay. on item number 95. So we've, okay. we've now voted to add emergency clauses both to 95 and to 96. Now we have to go back and vote on the main motion as amended. And so okay. now we're voting on item 95 as amended with the emergency clause. Thank you for that explanation. No worries, thank you. Well, I think I helped confuse everyone since <laughs> I went on uh, during the amendment, so yeah. I, I didn't want to interrupt. It was a really good speech. It was very magnanimous and accurate. So uh, to the main motion as- and so, so we will vote uh, one more time after this one, correct? Correct, that's exactly okay. right. Okay, I. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Um, just for my new colleagues, don't feel bad. We all have been there. We've all been trying to figure out where we are in this process, especially when we do maneuvers on the spot. Uh, it, it's a learning process and you guys are wonderful. So don't, don't sweat the small stuff. Um, I, I want to take this opportunity to really thank uh, Director Long her incredible team, the community members who came and spoke so eloquently today about the work ahead. Um, but I also want to put a cautionary tale in. Um, as you know, this levy is a stopgap. It doesn't do anything to resolve the over-reliance on the general fund or the uh, long uh, maintenance backlogs that we have. And I hope that we're starting with this levy thinking about what we do when this levy is up. Five years sounds like a long time, but uh, what I know is that that's gonna go just like that. And if we're not starting today planning for what the future looks like, we're gonna be back to a knee jerk reaction. Let's just re, re up the levy and do it later, right? Uh, not gonna work long term. Um, incredible work. I look forward to what we build together uh, coming out of this pandemic and I'm happy to vote aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. 95 ordinance passes as amended. 96, all the rule is amended. Rubio. Thank you. I want to thank Mayor Wheeler and my fellow commissioners for approving this um, important budget for our parks and recreation system. And this budget represents a significant shift for Portland Parks and Recreation. And it's a shift that centers equity access and layers the foundation for a sustainable future where all Portlanders can feel safe and welcome in our parks and natural areas and where everyone can access programs that bring us together, help us heal and make our whole community healthier. I want to thank Director Long and the whole Portland Parks and Recreation team as well. I know that the Bureau has been through a very tumultuous few years that have included hard decisions uh, to ensure long-term sustainability and growth for future generations. Also strategic thinking to prepare for our growing cities to meet our communities during COVID-19. And the hard work is far from being finished, um, as we've just talked about. There's still more work to do and to work toward, but we do have an extremely dedicated and values-driven parks um, employees, especially our frontline workers and those who work hard this last weekend over the storm, and a creative and supportive leadership team that will help us get there. And this makes me very, very proud to be parks commissioner. I'm really excited to help lead and support the critical work we're about to take on together because I understand how important it is for our city and especially now. And like our late friend, uh, past parks director and city commissioner Charles Jordan said, parks are more than just fun and games. 
Parks build community. They connect people to people, people to neighborhoods, and people to land. So finally, I want to thank the Portlanders who chose to invest in their parks and recreation system through the parks levy. None of this would be possible without this commitment to preserve and protect what past generations started building and to strengthen and grow our park system to serve all Portlanders equitably. So thank you to everyone and I vote aye. Ryan. Yes, um, everything I said earlier uh, is now on the record. So I just wanna say aye. Hardesty. Uh, that was smooth, Commissioner Rod. I like that. Uh, um, I, let me just say that uh, this is a day to be proud. Uh, it's a day for us to know that we are investing in things that build community and build community safety. Uh, what we know from the, all the national data is that in places where people have access to green spaces, uh, communities are healthier because of it. Uh, so. Um, look forward to the incredible work that I know Commissioner Rubio will do in partnership with Director Long um, and know that we are here as your supporters and advocates to help you do the work uh, that you have ahead. I'm happy to vote aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. This process had its genesis over four years ago and uh, I'm thinking back to the very first budget hearing that I attended as a newly admitted mayor. And given all that we've been through in the last year, COVID wildfires, uh, most recently snow, some of the other crises that we're facing as a community, it's hard to remember that at that first budget hearing, people came out by the hundreds to testify in opposition to further reductions in the parks budget. And they've come out subsequently for every one of our budget hearings. And what we've heard loudly and clearly, not only in those hearings, in our own town halls, our own community meetings, but now through the overwhelming support of this measure at the ballot, that the public strongly supports their park system here in the city of Portland. And they wanna protect that park system. And so I wanna start by just thanking the people of this city who even during economic difficulties chose to tax themselves for the purpose of holding the line on their Parks Bureau. And indeed, uh, as we heard during testimony today, providing the opportunity for new investments that'll take our Parks Bureau in an exciting new direction. And I think to the betterment of the entire community. So I wanna thank my colleagues. I wanna thank my former colleagues, uh, including Commissioner Fish, who went a long way towards helping us to understand the hydraulics of the Parks Bureau budget and some of the fiscal issues that we were facing. Uh, I wanna thank Commissioner Fritz for uh, her time and dedication and support of the efforts to get this uh, referral to the ballot. And I wanna thank my own team for their hard work on this as well. And to my colleagues on the council and especially Commissioner Rubio, you now have uh, a big weight on your shoulders because as Commissioner Hardesty has just indicated, we're never there. Uh, we've come a long, long way. We have a lot to be proud of and we should take this moment to, to step back and look at the view for a moment and appreciate how high we've climbed, uh, but there's still work to be done in the months and the years ahead. And uh, as the Parks Commissioner, a lot of this burden is gonna fall to you and your team but I have utmost confidence in you and in them and in Parks Director Adina Long and her entire team and all of our volunteers, some of whom we heard from earlier today who, who are so passionate and engaged and supportive in terms of their time, their talent, their energy in helping keep our Parks Bureau an integral part of what makes this city so fantastic. So thank you all. I vote aye, the ordinance is approved as amended. Thank you. And now we will go, believe it or not, to the last item on our agenda this morning, item number 100. Proclaim week of March 7 through 13, 2021 to be Women in Construction Week. 
And I can't help but noticing this is a, a seminal moment. This is our 100th item that we've taken up as a city council this year. So for those of you who are just starting out on the council, that gives you some idea of how many things we're gonna look at over the course of the year. So I'm proud colleagues to support the Women in Construction Week proclamation sponsored by the Norwich Portland Chapter 54. This proclamation celebrates the work done so far to increase the participation and success of women in the construction industry in particular. It also reminds us that more work remains to be done. And I know that as a city council, we've had lots of conversations about this important issue and the role that we can collectively play to help improve the numbers. Speaking of which, nationwide, women make up about 13% of construction workers. This is a significant improvement over previous decades, going back to the 1960s, when women made up only about 6% of the workforce. Uh, but in recent years, what we've seen is while there's been tremendous growth over time, the figure has remained relatively stagnant in recent years. In other words, we've hit a plateau with regard to increasing the number of women in the workforce in the construction trades. The city of Portland is working with our regional public agency and nonprofit partners to increase workforce diversity in the construction trades by providing both reliable career paths for women as well as for people of color. The National Association of Women in Construction and NAWC has made great strides in increasing the number of women who work in the construction industry since it was founded in 1953. And we salute the NAWIC Portland Chapter 54 for the work they're doing to support women's advancement and growth in the construction trades here in the city of Portland. And so with that, colleagues, I will read a proclamation. And if anybody has anything they'd like to share at the end, I would certainly entertain that. This is a proclamation on behalf of the entire city council celebrating this important uh, effort. Whereas the NAWIC Portland Chapter 54 has distinguished itself for 59 years as the voice of women in construction in Portland, Oregon. Whereas the work done by the NAWIC Portland Chapter 54 has benefited the city of Portland through community development and educational programs. And whereas the NAWIC Portland Chapter 54 has unceasingly promoted the employment and advancement of women in the construction industry. And whereas the construction community represented by NAWIC Portland Chapter 54 has been a driving force in fostering community development through renovation and beautification projects, promotion of skilled trade careers, and a positive vision for the future. And whereas the NAWIC Portland Chapter 54 has sought to achieve successful results for Portland, Oregon and surrounding areas in a cooperative spirit with other organizations. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, the mayor of the city of Portland, Oregon, the city of Roses, do hereby recognize the NAWIC Portland Chapter 54 and its many dedicated volunteers for its steadfast work on behalf and support of women in construction and do proudly proclaim the week of March 7th through 13th, 2021 as Women in Construction Week in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this day. Thank you. Colleagues, anything further to add? It looks like we got it covered. Thank you all. Uh, Keelan, I believe that's our entire agenda. Am I right? That's correct. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a fantastic day. And as they say in the news, that's all there was. And we are adjourned.